Welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've practiced as a geotechnical engineer for over 17 and a half years. And in addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I have focused on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. By STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with none other than Ms. Joanna Smith, a geotechnical engineer with five years of experience in the areas of pile design and inspection, technical writing, project management, and leadership. At such a young age, she's achieved an enormous amount of success in her career. And in this episode, we'll be talking to her about her career success and the things she's done to help engineering students succeed and women to succeed in the field. Joanna holds a BS in civil engineering from Morgan State University and an MS in geotechnical engineering from John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She's a well-traveled geotechnical engineer, and she's worked in Wiz Biden, Germany, Cancun, Mexico, Jamaica, West Indies, Washington, D.C., and she currently works in New York City with AECOM. She's currently the geotechnical lead for the $1.9 billion Hunt Point Interstate Access Improvement Project. She's also a member of the Women in Deep Foundations Committee and the Ground Improvement Committee of the Deep Foundations Institute. And she is the ASCE Metropolitan Section Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Wow, I would say Joanna is very active and that's not all she's done. Joanna has also founded Daily Smith Incorporated, which is a STEM program as well as a musical experience. As a musician and engineer, she believes that music and math intersect and build confidence and technical skills. From her program, her students have excelled in math and science and have been successful in getting into the schools of choice upon excelling in auditions. Engineering is truly something, she says. It teaches us so many lessons and gives us so many perspectives, not only from the past, and present, but also to the future. And with that, let's jump in with our conversation with Joanna. Joanna, welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. We are honored to have you on the show. I just went through your bio for the listeners. Wow, you are busy in the geotechnical world. How are you feeling? I am feeling great, Jared. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor and I appreciate it. I'm doing well. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you were able to carve out some time in your schedule <laughs> to be here on the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. And I will just start out, Jonna, in your own words, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at AECOM on a daily basis? Oh, sure. Um, as a geotechnical engineer, um, there are various facets of, um, of my field. And so I can kind of speak to a little bit of design um, for the most part on various types of projects, whether they are airport projects, designing different foundations for that. Um, also designing different foundations for um, resilient projects. I know we had a project out in Hamill's Y um, and we had to do some rehabilitation there. Um, also looking at the geotechnical field investigations, which are very important at the preliminary stages, um, kind of uh, are seen throughout the, the geotechnical program. Um, that's very important. And, and the geotechnical um, investigations are not only just um, going out into the field and actually taking a look at um, the soil conditions, but also writing the reports, also um, operating somewhat as a geotechnical project manager, I like to call it. Um, you are um, in, involved in the various stakeholders, the clients um, on the ACOM side and also within the field um, and outside of the field. And so it's definitely a niche. Um, however, there is a, um, a various different types of aspects of, of engineering that's involved. And so um, it's not just, you know, doing one si side of the work, but also um, working alongside different individuals. And so your communication skills and your soft skills, as well as your technical skills, um, are all a part of the development of, you know, leading out in the geotechnical field. Uh, so alongside that, um, you know, part of that is what I do and also getting involved with um, different organizations 
um, within geotechnical engineering, which is also very important. Um, within AECOM for me, not only um, like Deep Foundation Institute and ASCE, um, but also um, AECOM's aspect of geotechnical engineering, where we are a global company. And so we are always, especially for myself, I'm always looking to see how I can um, incorporate um, the geotechnical engineering persons in the Americas and also internationally um, and be a part of different projects, not only in the United States, but around the world. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, as far as geotechnical engineering, there's a lot that you could do within the geotech world. There's a lot you can do within the civil world. But what is it that drew you to geotech? I would have to say it was the hands-on part of everything, right? Um, a lot of the time, uh, and that's, I, well, I guess more for like civil engineering. Um, when I thought civil, I always thought structural. That's usually how we were taught um, in school. There are various aspects of civil uh, but it seemed that everything was kind of by the book, uh, very manual based, uh, kind of sit down in a cubicle and, and do calculations. Um, and I am a person that loves to move around. Uh, I love to kind of have my hands in uh, different aspects of things um, in order to create this wholesome approach. So, um, you know, when I think about that, that's kind of like uh, my outlook on, on geotechnical engineering. Yeah, and why I got involved in geotechnical engineering because it wasn't just manual, but it was also a lot of feel that was involved, um, as well as you know being in the office, as well as speaking to the clients. And so I was really able to see a well-rounded view of my career versus um, just kind of staying on one side um, <laughs> or being in the office really. Uh, so I would say the hands-on approach to geotechnical engineering is why I decided to take that route. Makes sense. And definitely as a geotechnical engineer, you're able to move around quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like it's working out well for you. I understand yeah. that you're currently the geotechnical lead yes. for the $1.9 billion with the B dollar Hunts Point Interstate Access Improvement Project. That sounds like a huge responsibility. Yes, Can you tell us more about is. that project and what you Oh, doing? definitely. So, um, you know, in 2017, we won the first phase of this project. Um, and my, uh, my superior at the time, um, Ms. Karen Armfield, was just so excited to put me on this project. And I worked alongside her and she said, hey, I think you can lead it, you know, after a, um, some guidance. And um, it has definitely been, you know, an amazing experience. What I thought was really interesting about the Hunts Point project is uh, that I am from the Bronx. Um, I'm from the Northeast Bronx. Uh, however, you know, South or North, it's very important to recognize that you're able to use your degree and, um, and, and impact your community. Um, and you're getting paid for it. So that's even better, yeah, right? That's, that's a win. That's a win. <laughs> uh, that's a win-win, right? Um, and so, you know, this to me really, um, you know, I developed many sentiments through this project. Um, Karen Armfield, who was my superior at the time, um, was very helpful in taking me under her wing and teaching me, um, you know, some of the very important aspects of managing a project, especially with the geotechnical side from, um, you know, doing the bids to getting it awarded, uh, which are actually some things that I learned while I was on my internship in, in Germany with Army Corps of Engineers. So it's wow. kind of interesting to see that through college, you know, doing um, internships also impacted what I'm doing now. And so I was sitting on those boards with, you know, with the Army Corps and I was um, choosing the subcontractors based on, of course, the, the numbers that we were getting and also um, their capacity to do the work um, and, you know, their performance and just different um, subsets of a uh, checklist that we had. And so to, to see the same thing kind of happen here um, at AECOM was very helpful. And so I went from um, managing MATOC um, and JOC projects, which is job order contracts and uh, multiple order task contracts um, in, in the core that range up to uh, from 500,000 to a million dollars. Now I'm managing, you know, $1.9 billion project. So um, it was really interesting to kind of see how um, these things kind of move together in terms of saying, okay, well, this is an internship that happened in 2010, but 10 years later, now we see, you know, the, the real offspring of it and, and, and what has come forth from it. Uh, so this project as well um, is a rehabilitation project. And so we are 
um, filling different aspects of Hunts Point um, in terms of filling in uh, some of the embankments that are there right now. We are also um, moving in terms of um, an exit ramp and an entrance ramp. We're changing the locations. We also had uh, GPR um, surveying to do there as well because there's an under uh, a tunnel that's running um, underneath the ground, a subway tunnel. Um, and so these were uh, some major things that you know I, I was working with. Um, also the geography and um, the the we're right next to a fault line right there, and so there there are parts of of this project um, where rock can be found at five feet, and there are parts of this project where rock can be found at 110 feet. Wow. And so we can see a drastic change. Um, at the fault lines, um, also the the type of rock changes as well. We have schist, we have quartz over there. We have um, I'm trying to remember what the other I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, we have um, inward marble, and so you can see where the plates are are kind of interconnecting, and you can see where the fault lines um, are changing. And so this project was very challenging. Um, it was exciting. Uh, lots of, of time schedules and, and constraints here. We were, I had approximated finishing this job, I would say phase two um, um, in two months, they wanted it done in a month. So, oh. <laughs> so you know, how do we condense this? How do we make sure that, you know, we're, we are hitting the location that we need to in terms of pair locations and what is most necessary in order to, to have this contract awarded? Um, and for the contractors to be happy with the information they were getting so that we get a decent price, right? Uh, so, you know, th this project has definitely been one um, that I've learned from a lot. Um, it's definitely been one that has um, allowed me to, to grow as an engineer um, and also as a leader. Um, and for that, I'm definitely grateful. Wow, that's awesome. It sounds like you got a little bit of everything there as far as the change in uh you know, geography, uh, sorry, geology going down below and then, you know, the timing of the schedule, a little bit of everything. And you hinted at what you were doing in Germany. So as an intern, I understand that you were responsible, you were working on projects where you were rehabilitating uh, military structures in Germany with the Corps? Yeah, yeah. So these were um, different structures. I'm not sure if it's classified. <laughs> well, but, well um... yeah, don't, don't tell us anything that's top secret, but I mean, high level. Sounds but like yeah, they, they were definitely different structures that we were working on. Um, I remember I was in Ramstein, Germany. Uh, we had also got to visit um, General Kip Ward, who was um, a four-star general um, in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and he was definitely um, very receptive to us. It was about uh, seven of us who had gone out there. Um, it was a very rigorous selection process. Um, and I was the only one who was able to work in the installation support branch as well as working on some of the fiscal year um, uh, money that we had and you know, looking at how we had to get that money allocated to projects uh, before the year was out or else the money is gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, uh, so, so these were some of the building blocks, I would say, um, you know, that allowed me to be able to, to do what I'm doing now. Wow, that, that's, that's awesome to hear because uh, it, you know, we often talk about the importance of getting an internship and how yeah, an internship can help you to get a full-time job, but, but more importantly, it kind of gives you an introduction to what it looks like to be an engineer. Yeah. And it sounds like you made a great transition from, you know, now, 10 years from after your internship, you're actually doing that uh, on the mainland, which, just, which is just awesome. It's awesome. Now, um, the publisher of the podcast, the Engineering Management Institute, they believe in diversity and inclusion. And from what I know of you, you've, you've often said you're passionate about diversity and inclusion as well. Can you tell us more about how you strive to improve diversity and inclusion in the civil or geotech world in your sphere? Most definitely. Um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I think that we have to start at our, um, our hiring uh, management levels uh, for the most part. Um, and I'm going to kind of speak about that and also the, I call it the pipeline effect. Um, and I've been having these conversations with um, some of the executives within ACOM and it, it's really been great to uh, be a voice and an advocate, especially at this time. Um, but when I want to speak about, I want to speak about the hiring process simply because um, I think it's important for us to develop relationships um, with universities um, internationally. And doesn't only have to be, you know, as I said, it can be international, it can be also in the Americas or wherever you'd like it to be. Um, but universities are also diverse. 
um, in just like how they're diverse in the type of subjects they teach, you know, the scope of work, um, the intensity of, of the different subject matters that are taught. We are also diverse, in, also, they are also diverse in, um, you know, ethnicities and the way different people think because they are from different spaces. Um, and so I think it's very important for us to look uh, creating partnerships with different universities and also um, creating partnerships with um, the different diversity um, programs um, that are in these universities. Uh, when I spoke about Germany earlier, um, I was a part of a program called AMI and it was um, um, American Minority Interest in Engineering. Um, and that pro advancing, sorry, advancing minority interest in engineering. Um, and that program was very helpful for me because of the opportunities we had. So I went to Morgan State University. At Morgan State, we had a plethora of opportunities available for us. That um, Army Corps of Engineer project it was also in um, Hawaii. It was also in uh, um, uh, North uh, Korea. Um, it was also in um, a few other, I know it was in Germany because I was there, um, but it was pretty much an international um, you know, affiliation. And so I think that when we are purposeful um, and intentional, these words are very important um, in making sure that we advance you know, those spaces, then we can definitely create that within our environments. Um, and so that's very important and I think that's definitely something um, that we can do moving forward and I can do moving forward as, as an advocate and as I have been advocating for. Um, so I am working alongside um, some of the executives and it's definitely been a great, um, great time to be at ACOM, especially within, within this time frame. I'm talking about the pipeline effect. Um, I think this is also very important. I'm not sure how many schools are, are or how many, um, how much of corporate America is involved. I'm sure we have a few companies that are, but I think that working on the middle school level and also the high school level is very important where we are getting into the schools, whether it is um, being a part of a STEM program. Um, and I, I would say at least try to impact maybe 500 just within the first five years, right? Different mm -hmm. offices have maybe five regions within the Americas or whatever it is. Say, hey, we're going to adopt, you know, 100 students, over the course of this five year for each region. And you know that's definitely something that would be great to put your name to, um, not only just for what it would look like, but for the impact that it's having um, on generations forever, really forever. Um, and it's really a way to leave a legacy. And so um, that is what I think is very important in terms of looking at diversity and inclusion. Um, and so because of that, and because of my love for that, um, I created my own company called Daily Smith Incorporated, um, which has a branch of, of STEM as well. Um, and so I'm going to be pushing that forward this year and for years to come within our communities. Um, so apart from that, I'm also the uh, vice chair, not the vice chair anymore. Look at me, I'm still in last year. I'm now the chair <laughs> of okay, the <diversity> inclusion <laughs> uh, for ASTE for the Metropolitan Section. Wow. And um, that's very important, uh, I think, you know, to be able to diversify the scope there. And really, I think it starts with conversations as well, um, you know, and just having these conversations of, hey, how can we make sure that we are creating a space? How can we make sure that we are doing our best um, to advocate for ourselves and to also have other colleagues that are speaking on the behalf of, of moving um, and pushing excellence forward all together with what it looks like of any skin tone? Um, of any hue, um, but we are really looking at the talent and, and the capacity that everyone has to add value uh, to projects and um, just to life in general, especially engineering from a, um, I call it the world view of engineering, right? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. really what it is. So that's my outlook on diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Well said. And um, it's, it's great that these conversations are happening now. Um, you know, some people call them courageous conversations, other people call them difficult conversations, but it's good that we're having the conversation, Definitely. Because, you know, as engineers, especially as geotechs, a lot of times, you know, we pride ourselves in, in being problem solvers and, and dealing with challenges. But, you know, a lot of times as engineers, geotechnical engineers, we need the given information first. And it's like, you know, as we start to talk about diversity and inclusion, if we're not willing to have these conversations like the ones you're having with your executive team, 
we, we can't truly have change. So it's, it's, I'm glad to hear that those things are happening. Um, and, and I know that mentoring is something that's been, that you've been passionate about. And if I understand correctly, you've mentored students from elementary school all the way up through like pre-college. And, and I believe that mentorship is, is, is truly important. The reason why I've had, you know, the successes that I've had is because of my mentors, you know, mm -hmm. but can you tell us more about what mentorship has been for you and, you know, as a mentee or a mentor? Definitely. I mean, I can speak from both, um, aspect actually I, i'll speak a little bit from the from the mentor standpoint um first because uh you know being the young woman who everyone kind of looks up to whether it's church or whether it's school um just me being the one who's out of the box um and that's not in a bad way but i'd say not necessarily conforming to the norm or, or whatever that that really means um you know, it, it's affording me many opportunities and just really being myself um, and, and really saying, hey, you know, if this is something that you want to do, you should definitely go out and do it. Um, I think especially within geotechnical engineering, I tell my friends all the time, my music students, they're all going to be engineers. They don't even know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and it's really just about speaking to um the greatness that you have within you. So this, this kind of supersedes the aspects of engineering, right? It's really just speaking to the greatness that you have within you. Um, what is it that you really like to do? Um, who is it that you need to, to uh, link up with? And, and who is it that you need in your network? And, and really going and speaking to those people. Um, and so for, for the, the young people that I work alongside, I actually have a young man who was also doing the piano with me and he's a civil engineer wow. um, he, and he was so excited he was in high school i think he started doing piano with me when he was 16. he's excelled he's done an amazing job um and now he's working at different spaces and getting paid for it and did a different thing that helped him to go through his civil engineering you know college and it's just really great to be able to talk to him and say hey you should join ASCE hey i think you should try to lead out you know in in Nesby, or hey i think you should you know be a part of um, you know, the ASCE bridge program that we have going on, or, you know, we have internships coming up, be a part. So it's, it's really great to see how you can bridge the gap that way. Um, and, and really just teaching and just saying, hey, I think that you're great at this. How do we go forward? And how do we become the best at that? Um, and so that's what, you know, the mentoring aspect has done for me, um, and also done for my students It really taught me patience as well. Um, I think um, it's so funny because sometimes I'm, I don't think I'm that patient. The parents say, you're so patient with them. I'm like, really? <laughs> but it's really that I just want them to recognize the greatness that's in them. And I want them to be able to move forward on whatever footing it is. Engineering, really. I saw that pun. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so in terms of being a mentee, um, I've definitely had the opportunity to, um, and I'm really grateful for that, to be mentored by some really great people. Um, I would say I have some veterans in my company um, uh, who have been there for a very long time and who have great insight within the engineering field. Um, and I remember working alongside some women and women in deep foundations and uh, their outlook on mentoring was that you should have at least seven mentors. Wow. around the world wow seven and i said yeah. i believe it okay <laughs> i like it I, exactly right and i you know the biggest thing for me was when you're crossing time zones you're doing something and what i've recognized is that the mentorship that i've been receiving um some of them have been local and they have been um starting out and they still are um i would say um miss karen armfield Ali Mohammed, who's in my office as well, Giselle Pasalakwa, there's some, some folks on my team. Mr. Jared, he doesn't even know oh, it, but yeah. just watching him, you know, and, and, and that's the thing about mentoring that's really interesting. Sometimes we think that someone has to kind of like, we have to be shadowing them all the time, but sometimes just someone's life is just a witness to you um, cool. of, of where you can go and what you can do. Um, so that has been very helpful for me, um, I would say internationally, and also just moving over into different, I have a, one of, I shouldn't be shouting my mentors, I don't, 
a little stingy with that. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to shout one more out. Miss Marcy, uh, I don't know if you know Marcy. She's an ASC as well. She's definitely uh, been a great mentor. She's a geotechnical engineer as well. I remember meeting her um, at an ASC conference that I presented at. And um, I saw her on stage and I was assessing everybody who was talking. And I, I ran, I was like, that's, that's her. I don't know what it is about wow. her, but I know that she, she's going to be in my life forever. And when I spoke with her over the, the duration of time, you know, she told me that she had ran two companies of her own. Um, and, you know, now she does nothing but C-suite. <laughs> and I said to myself, I see that, you know, I, I see myself there. I see myself in you. She's also an athlete and, um, she had gotten into a really bad accident, but she came through and had done a marathon after that. And, wow. you know, it's things like that. Uh, when we think about mentorship, it really is a, 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 a worldview. Um, it's really speaking to persistence. Yeah. It's speaking to resilience. It's speaking to continuing um, to go on. Um, it's speaking to overcoming challenges um, and strength, really, and the power that different individuals have. Because the truth is that, um, you know, you don't necessarily need a, a mentor in your field. And I know I just kind of spoke about all geotechnical engineers. So clearly I'm, I'm working on diversifying my mentorship. <laughs> um, you got plenty but, of time. <laughs> right? Okay. You got plenty of time. <laughs> so funny. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's really about um, people around don't necessarily have to be in your field to mentor you. Um, but it's, it's a positivity and it's the ability to continue to grow forward even when things don't look as, as nice um, or look as great um, or look as promising as you expected, but just knowing that you will do better, um, you will be great, and you are great, and yeah. really manifesting that greatness within you. Um, and so that's really what mentorship has done for me um, and what mentoring really means to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I can say that I remember... Uh, I think I first met you at an ASCE um, Met Metropolitan section. I think you came up to me afterwards. We had a short conversation. I can say that um, over the years, I'm super proud to see where you are and where you're going, you know, and uh, to be included in that list of mentors makes me feel nice. <laughs> if I, you know, I'm not claiming, you know, that I had anything to do with your, your success. All right. All right. <laughs> I, I'm glad that I could be in that list. <laughs> but um, I think that one of the powerful things about mentorship when it's done right is that you see the mentor, you see the mentee, and then like you talk about that pipeline, you, you just continues, right? So you started an organization. You said Daly Smith Incorporated. And if I understand correctly, it takes STEM education, but also ties it with the musical experience. Definitely. And I remember when you got the, um, when, you were acknowledged as one of, when you were acknowledged as one of the new faces to watch, and ASCE, and I was looking at the list. I was like, whoa, well, I know her. I know her, you know? <laughs> and you were talking about the tie of music and geotech and engineering. Tell us more about that, because I think it's fascinating. And let us know a little bit more. Oh, about definitely. Music. So um, what's really exciting about this is that I found that a lot of engineers are musicians. Hmm. Um, I actually had a friend who was a physicist at IBM. And... Um, Upon speaking to him, he was telling me that um, he's a trumpeter um, and he, uh, IBM had produced an entire CD of only IBM employees that created a whole CD of music. Wow. It was phenomenal. Um, so and I recognized, I, I thought I was the only one, but then it definitely made sense to me because music and, and, and math go together. Um, for all my musicians out there, when you think about the scale, right, you have 12 scales. And if you're not a musician, just listen up, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have 12 scales. They're major scales and they're minor scales. So everything has one and almost like an inverse of each other, right? So, you know, you think about the differential equations, you think about just a fraction, you think yeah. about something to the negative one power. Um, you know, all of these things kind of speak to a derivative of something. And you think about frequencies. Um, you think about pitch, those are all numbers, right? Measured in hertz or measured by a sine graph or a cosine graph. Um, and so all of these things are really, they really interact. You think about pitch. Um, when you think about the number scale system, it's an octave, oct, right? Prefix means eight. And when mm. you play um, and you keep going up as you, you know, you land from one to the other. And so the same note C to the next C, there's eight notes in between them. And so you start to see a pattern once again, same thing with math. 
Um, and so I think it, it's really interesting to, to recognize that when you start to put chords together, it's a number system. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you want to play a chord, you play one, the one, the three, and the five. And wow. so there you go. Boom, right? Uh, so all of these things really allow you to start to think critically. And so a lot of pianists or um, folks who have taken music um, or even piano teachers um, will tell you, you know, everyone's not going to be a pianist. Everybody's not going to be like a concert pianist. Everybody's not wanna, is not going to want to play on stage or play for events. But what it does for you um, is it definitely works on the critical thinking um, portion of your mind. Um, and so it's definitely not only that, but it's great to be able to sh to show your talent. Um, it's definitely music is a is a language almost like well not almost like math, right? It's readable. Um, it's something that transcends uh, your regular ability to speak or to understand a language. If somebody says five or six in another country, unless they write differently, they can identify that, okay. right? And so it is the same thing with music. Um, if someone was to play gospel or play the Bach or play um, you know, Fred Bliss or something, you can definitely say, wow, that's beautiful. It, it's definitely a universal theme throughout. Um, and so to me, there, there's, there's a, there is a, um, a joining there of, of both of, of the sciences and the arts together. Um, and what I've recognized, especially in my community, is that I see a lot of um, this innate um, gravity towards the music. But when we come to the science and the numbers, sometimes mm. it's not as strong. Um, and so for me, this is uh, one of my mission here, I know, uh, to be able to bring those together so that it's fun and it's exciting. And so when we start talking about the sciences and we start talking about combustion or we start talking about fuel or energy um, or putting stuff together, hey, I want you to build this, it will start to, to bring some understanding like, oh, in music, we, come, we put this chord together. And if we put that together to make that sound, then in some way, shape, or form, I can put this here, um, or I can construct this object, or I can create this calculation in order to, to yield um, this product, right? Um, and so that's really how I, that's my standpoint. I think it's definitely something new. I've been doing my work, my homework, and trying to find books on music and math. Um, I know Herbie Hancock has some information on that, and he has a whole program, um, but he's Herbie Hancock, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I'm finding it a little difficult. It seems like it's an untapped um, zone as of right now. So it's definitely something I'm, I'm, I'm doing, and it's been, it's been great. Um, many students have been excelling um, in their, their mathematics and their science practices on um, they've also been doing well in their <clears throat> abilities and being accepted to different schools that they were interested in being accepted to and so it's great to see that when you have a passion for something and you act towards it and you create a solution for it um, that it really it really does happen and it really does um, start to kind of bring life to itself um, you know in the areas of, of which you would like to bring life to uh, so music and math are definitely integrated. They move together as one. And um, it's great to see that. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, I, I, I can remember, you know, I remember math classes as a kid. I remember math classes in high school and college. And it's just this stigma attached to math. Sometimes it's like, oh, it's hard or it doesn't make sense or it's not tied to reality. And it's just like, those are false notions. But to tie it with music, it's like, wow. You went really deep there with the chords and everything. I'm like, wow, that's 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 pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But um, I'm 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 excited to hear about those connections that uh, that you're sharing with the, the the next generation. You know, and with that, I I, I want to say that the you know you have a quote in your bio that we shared earlier. And I just think it's so powerful. You said engineering is truly something. It teaches us so many lessons and gives us so many perspectives, not only from the past and present but also for the future. Can you share with us that, number one, like <laughs> a little bit more about that quote, which is heavy. I mean, that's not like Hallmark stuff. That's heavy, right? Um, but, you know, share a little bit about where that's coming from. And then also uh, let us know if there's a, an important lesson that you've found in your career that's helped you so far that you want to share with our listeners. I think that'd be worthwhile. Definitely. So, 
you know, when you think about, at least for me, when I think about engineering, I really think about the analysis and also the synthesis of something. So the breaking down of something and, and building it back up. Um, when I was younger, my parents would, but I was always like the tomboy of the family. I wasn't really the girly girl. It was funny. I remember I used to pop my sister's doll's heads off and um, let them blow in the water. <laughs> And it was so, the funny part about that was even in me doing that and trying to fix them back, um, I remember that I was always the one that could braid my hair, you know, yeah. if I needed to sew in or I wanted to braid, you know, extensions, I would do, always do it. And my sister who was playing with all the dolls and combing their hair and just, she never, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, did, she was not the one to be hands on like that. And so you know, it really kind of showed me that as you look to how the mechanics of, of something works or as you look to figure out how things come together or, or how they break apart slowly, um, you start to understand the fundamentals of, of that object wow. um, or of those things. And so when I speak about engineering um, and, and, and the lessons it teaches us, I'm not just speaking to, you know, our... Um, geotechnical calculations or our design for a foundation or our design for, you know, a skyscraper structure and the manuals. Um, I'm also speaking to the engineering of how, if you want to think about basic things work, right? Like, okay, well, basic in my head is building things. So, <laughs> so if I wanted to build a gate or I wanted to build a fence, what's the first thing I'm going to do, right? These are the basics. Um, mm. What's the first thing I'm going to do? And when I think about that, I think about children. So a lot of the times I think that we um, complicate everything. Um, mm. And really, everything is really just based on basic engineering. So we know that unless we're speaking to future city and the floating city, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even there, we have to have a foundation, yeah. right? And that foundation needs to be strong enough so that, I mean, hopefully we're not in an earthquake simulated area, but um, we're just going to leave that there. We're not yeah. in California today. Um, but we should be able to create something that can stand on something for a certain period of time, amount of years or whatever it is. And, and so that is really the engineering. How can I make this work? How can this stand? How can the integrity of the state um, and, and that will allow us to see how it's done now. But then when you look to the, the historical aspects of it, you say, hey, how did they do it before? If you mm. don't want to reinvent the, the wheel, right? And that's usually what people do. They do the research. Um, and, and so when you think about that, of the basics of something, how did we do it before? Okay, well, how, how are we doing it now? And then for the future, how is this going to impact our generations, right? So even the engineering of saying, how does math and science and the music work together, that engineering might have been something that they've done years ago that I don't necessarily know about. But how is that going to impact the future? It's going to create leaders. It's going to create new thinkers. It's going to create a generation of, of people that recognize and understand the strengths that they have within them, not only just from building things, but also building their generations. And so the engineering of that. And so I really, I, I love speaking like this because it really speaks to the, the larger perception behind um, what engineering is, right? Um, and so when we produce things, we also produce people, we also produce new ideas, we also produce new thinkers. Um, and that's really how we create the generation that we have now. And that's really how we create um, excellence over time, right? Uh, so, so that's just a little bit of, of kind of where that was coming from. Um, in terms of the depth of that and the root of that, really, um, different things that have that have engineered <laughs> uh, my path. Um, I really think that you know everything in my engineering career really boils down to just persevering um, and just you know just to keep on going uh, and and just recognizing. I remember uh, we had a talk at ASCE a roundtable. I thought it was so interesting. Someone. Um, mentioned their engineering career almost as a jungle gym mm. and so we don't necessarily think of it as being linear at all times right because it may not be yeah. um at least for me i know it necessarily hasn't it may seem like that um but i remember that with the way i got into geotechnical engineering i was doing a um a a job with clark construction and i was a uh, i was a assistant superintendent 
at Clark Construction. Okay. Um, and it was great. Once again, I had that, that outlook of doing everything. I was doing the man hours, who was on site. I was uh, watching the column pours. I was doing the drawings, checking the orientation of the columns. And I was working alongside a geotechnical engineer that started writing up um, pink slips. If the bento seal wasn't put on properly and the tie backs weren't, um, you know, weren't done to his liking. And I was, I was all one like, no, 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 no. What else do we have to do? You know? <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and I remember, uh, he was, it was Ramadan and it was so hot outside and we were just, we had such a great conversation, but he was telling me, you know, he didn't eat because of it. I'm like, well, maybe that's why he's so cranky. He's just, <laughs> just writing up all these pink slips, you know, um, but that's how I got into geotechnical engineering. And it wasn't just because, you know, I had, um, well, I want to say that's how I got into it, but that was really what sparked my interest. Um, I would say wholeheartedly to say, okay, well, I'm going to go into this field. And I say that story just to say that it wasn't that I was necessarily doing geotechnical engineering the whole time, but I was interested in construction. And then I kind of went into geotech. So it's kind of like, you know, this jungle gym type of outlook of, of saying, hey, this was great. I might like this right now. And I may like this right now. And I'm still going to stay in the field because once again, it's a wholesome approach. Everything is interconnected. Um, I was just watching a video actually that you put up and I just want to tell you, thank you so much for um, the, the content that you put up on LinkedIn. They're not boring. You know, sometimes everything just seems so dry, like some rocks and some sediment over there, like over the metamorphic <laughs> rocks that all there, like geotech, like, <laughs> you know, but um, when you, you, you put something up about, it's, it's called Six Figures No Suits, Mm, I yeah. might be saying that incorrectly, yeah, yeah. but I, that's pretty much the concept. So it was just really speaking to, once again, the unconventional way of engineering. And so these folks are out on the construction field, and I was really excited because I saw that they were um, doing a deep foundation design using post-tension cables, um, and they were done at an angle. And what was really exciting about it was I said, oh my goodness, it's construction, but they're totally doing a deep foundation. <laughs> <laughs> right? But they didn't have to put geotechnical engineering. Yeah. Um, but I'm just speaking to kind of like, once again, this wholesome approach, how everything is really interconnected within the engineering field. Um, and so that's really my experience um, with that quote. And also with just what, I guess in the whole engineering aspect has done for me um, within looking from the, the histor historical part of this to the present and also to the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow. So with that, we're going to come back in just a moment to close out our interview with Joanna and our career factor safety segment. Stick around. All right. All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor of safety in segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many other disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? So today, of course, we speak with Joanna Smith. Joanna, with all that you've accomplished and all that you've been involved with, one would have to wonder, how in the world does she keep from burning out? It's obvious that you must have some type of great time management and planning skills. Tell us, how do you manage to give yourself a factor of safety against burnout and do all that you're doing? Please share. Okay, with our awesome. So these guys did not ask me to do this, but I have a planner here. Oh. Um, and in my planner, so like I'm like teaching. In my <laughs> planner has like a day here. It tells you like, you know, what can you be grateful today? What are your tasks? And then it gives you like time slots. So. I'm old school. I still like to write things down as well as, you know, put things on my Outlook calendar. Um, but, when I, but when I plan my days out by using the time um, slots, it definitely helps me to manage my time a little more effectively. So I, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the difficulty of that part of things. Um, what happens sometimes is that you have to remember how much time it will take you to do a certain activity. And so sometimes you may, if you're like me, my sister laughs all the time. She's like, you build these schedules that are so strong. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> strong, not in a good way, but maybe a little bit of, of this overachiever type of uh, mentality going on here. Um, and so I would say for myself, what I've recognized is, okay, it might take me 
five or six hours to do this, or it might take me three to four hours. So I try not to um, be too um, strict on myself and, and put something for two hours that I know would take maybe three or four. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that has been very helpful in terms of keeping my time slot. Also, I would call it the carry on, carry over work. So sometimes in this time slot, you know, you're also, at least for me, I'm looking at the, 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 the priority of this task if you will, or the priority of this goal, right? And so if it's something that I can do for maybe two hours or an hour for that day and then kind of keep it going on throughout the week until it's done, um, that's definitely something I do as well. Um, also, what's very important is to tell yourself where you want to be. So if you're not as focused, you say, I am focused, right? You kind of repeat this stuff to yourself on a regular yeah. daily basis. This is called um, positive talk. Um, and th these things really help to brainwash you in a good way, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, positive self-talk definitely helps you to, to be where you wanna be. So that's definitely something I use as well. Um, and it has definitely been very helpful for me as well as writing um, the tasks and goals that I have down, as well as prioritizing them based on um, when they are due. Um, and so that has been that has been helpful. And of course, using an Outlook calendar is, as well. Um, if the task seems as though it may be a little bit overbearing, I definitely think it's helpful to have someone who can be an accountability partner, even if it's a friend like Jared, or <laughs> or you Shout might out. have <laughs> or you might have a coworker, um, you know, or someone who you know you can say, hey, I know I have this to do. Can you, you know, just check up on me and make sure that it's done? If so, uh, but you know, as we and that's maybe for the younger persons coming up in their careers or the older, depending on how your friendship works um, with your different coworkers. Um, but I think, um, you know, managing your time um, by writing it down and by also um, speaking positive words to yourself um, help you to 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 get the work done, uh, especially when you have a deadline. Um, but especially when you want to make sure that the clients are happy and that you are happy with the work that you deliver. Uh, so that, I think, is a factor of safety charge uh, there in terms of being successful um, and in terms of being able to get your work done on time and also building camaraderie with your friends and, and the community of, of engineers that you have as well. Excellent. Joanna, thank you so much for coming on. And thank you for sharing the great insights that you have. And thank you for your service to, in, to the industry as a whole and to your community, our community, I should say. Uh, you've shared some great information and advice that I know is going to help our listeners. Where can our listeners find you? Are you on oh, definitely. LinkedIn so, or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You? <laughs> so uh, you can find me at my personal website, um, which also speaks to my STEM program and also my music program. Um, my website is Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A-G, my middle initial. Uh, Smith at the MITH dot com. That's it. So you remember Joanna? <laughs> Coming to America. You remember Joanna? Remember? Joanna? <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop. Um, right. So uh, Joanna G Smith dot com. You can find me there. If you're on Instagram, um, you can find me at uh, Joanna Smith. Uh, if you want to check out my music page, you can also find that at Daily Smith Inc. Um, on Instagram. And if you're on Facebook, you can find me at Joanna Smith on Facebook. And if you're on LinkedIn, you can find me at Joanna Smith on LinkedIn. Um, so those are some spaces you can reach me. Uh, and I'll be definitely happy to have a conversation, talk to you, uh, whatever you need to move life and inspiration along. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. We would love to have your feedback, your comments, and your questions please feel free to go to the website, geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com, where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode four, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned in this episode. Until next time, we wish you all the best in your geotechnical engineering endeavors.